We're here for Hello. music with a very rousing introduction. Um, we are here to talk about music and tech and musicians, and we have two people at the sharp end of the industry. Um, Brian, who's a manager um, of Nomads, and Steve, who's a, an artist, a creator, but also a label owner. Um, so we're going to talk about this year where we've had Spotify growing, YouTube experimenting, we've had Tidal bought by Jay-Z, we've had all kinds of stuff going on, and artists are feeling the impact. So we're going to start, I suppose, with a good question about how are you feeling about the role of musicians in the world of tech this year? Um, I, I feel great. I think, I think it's been a really good year for, for streaming, first and foremost. You know, I think competition is always good. It's good for us because you know, all these uh, bigger companies are going to fight about who can get us you know, the best and, and who can work the hardest. So for, for us, it's, as an artist, I think it's been great. Um, it's, it's, a, it's a big world of, of music out there, so it's, it's good to be noticed and it's good to people talk about it too. And you, you've kind of grown up in this, in this world, haven't you? Of going from vinyl to downloads to yeah, streaming and you, yeah. you've kind of experienced it all in a short time. Yeah, I came, you know, I started out when I was uh, 12, 13 and I, I had my first release when I was 15. And then the past, you know, 18 years have been growing up in the music industry. And, and for me to see, you know, to go from cassette to vinyl to CDs to even mini disc, you know, to, uh, to, to, to downloads and to where we are now with, with the streaming, I think it's been such an amazing trip for me because mm -hmm. um, I still appreciate the physical, you know, so, so it's always been really interesting to see where we're going now. And I think, uh, you know, I, I, I really appreciate um, music where it's at right now. So mm -hmm. I think it's, it's a good time for us. Okay. Yeah, look, I, for me, um, one, of the, one of the great things that I'm seeing is new talent, new artists coming to, the, coming to the market at some level when they've got this interest in obviously both being creators and, uh, and being involved in their business as well and starting to really understand that the whole thing is not really just about trying to find a, a record deal and trying to find an advance and actually they're trying to build something that is going to last for a long time and you, you can see that shift. This year has been very similar to last year but you can feel it accelerating. Uh, and for me, that's probably one of the most exciting things, you know, having been in the music business for 20 odd years. Uh, it's, uh, it's, a, it's a good time. Yeah. I mean, I've heard kind of young artists talked about like, almost like startups. They have to build yeah. the business, they have to raise the funding, the backing. Yeah. And people talk about it's a very positive thing, that whereas artists one day once would have just made the music and someone would have taken care of business, now you can be involved in everything. And you oh, can for sure. You know, I, I think... I think now more than ever you can do everything yourself. You know, I, I, I've managed myself my whole life. I've, I ran my record label, and you know, I'm involved in legal to artworks to all the streaming. So for me, I can go and talk to these guys direct. I can go and, and, and talk to Daniel at Spotify and be like, hey, this is what I want to do. And you know, I, I think it's a good, really good time for artists. You know, you can you can do everything yourself. It's not as complicated as it was uh, 15 years ago or 10 years ago even where you had to go through all these filters to reach the masses. Now you can, you know, reach with, with social media, you can reach anybody out there. And I think, you know, I always try to tell everybody that, that don't sit around and wait. You know, you don't have to sit and wait for anybody. You, if you just want to go and pursue something, just go for it because, you know, you don't need anybody now. And I no, think that's, that's uh, the beauty yeah. of it. The, uh, but of course, the, the, uh, one of the interesting parts of that though is no one's got a divine right to be successful. So you can have the tools, you know, it's, a lot, it's obviously it's a lot cheaper now to make a record. You can reach a lot of people all over the world, but um, you have to be good and you have to work yeah. hard. You have to do all those things. You know, it's just because you can doesn't mean it's going to be a, a successful sure. business. Mm. Uh, and it's, I suppose that the parallels now within music are much more like uh, other industries mm. where you are, uh, you know, where you're a startup effectively, you, you're going to have to find some capital. You're going to have to find some fans. Um, and so, yeah, that, that's, that's, that's a, a big part of it. There, there is no right to be successful. Mm -hmm. I mean, how do we judge streaming's impact on musicians? Because there's been a rash of stories about artists saying, I got a royalty check for £2.50 from Spotify. How am I going to live? Is that, is that the start of a conversation about how artists make their money and the role streaming plays in it, in other kinds of revenue? Or? Uh, per personally, I think it's the artists who go back and talk to their record labels. You know, uh, record label still makes I don't know, 70 to 80 percent of your revenue, you know. So, for me, it's different because I've I've always owned my own rights and I always own my masters and and, and I get 100 percent, 
you know so for me it's always different but most of these guys has really poor they have a really poor deal with the record label from the beginning so obviously they're going to make less money but at the same time you know there's a lot of artists that are saying hey streaming is not paying you know but but those artists still has their videos up online without mm -hmm. getting paid so for me it's one of those usually always falls on a time when they need to market a record mm -hmm. you know when they attack these record label or or the streaming services because you know they get a lot of publicity out of mm -hmm. it but for me it's more like if, if, if you want, I, I, I started making music because I want to create music. Mm -hmm. I didn't start making music because I want to make money, mm -hmm. you know. Um, for a lot of these young boy bands or, or, or manufactured uh, groups, it's different because they were put together to make money, so they're a money-making machine. Mm -hmm. So for them it's different because they need to make money, for the, because the record labels invested a lot of money. But for me it's different. I'm just happy that anybody listens to my music. So. Mm -hmm. You know, sometimes you give stuff away for free, and, and I do that a lot. So it doesn't yeah. really matter for me. Yeah. No, I, I couldn't agree more. In fact, um, you know, just recently with our, with our last Nick Cave project, uh, we very much saw the streaming as the, I suppose, the language of his business that was going to allow other revenue streams to sort of propagate. And we did no, so Nick didn't do any, no TVs, no promo. Uh, we, nothing in advance. We just use streaming to get to as many people as we can, and off the back of that, built his business a bit further up the f food chain at some level, and that that worked out very, very well. So it is the, it's almost the language of that business. Uh, I think you make a good point, Steve. Actually, you know, if you're if you're an artist signed to one of the major corporations, then you are going to absolutely have a question mark over where's the, where's the money because the labels will, will on the whole will keep the vast bulk of it, and it's very difficult to see. How you, how you can actually um, quantify what you're supposed to be getting. If you're working with, uh, I suppose, more contemporary services like Cobalt label services or BMG label services, so forth, you, can, you get a much, you get a better, better, much better transparency and you can see what you're getting. But overall, I think the streaming thing for us is very much about build, helping those artists build their businesses. Mm. I mean, I was going to ask about new artists, because one of the things about streaming is if you're a big artist, you get a lot of streams, there's money there, and you mm. can do all kinds of things. If you're a brand new artist coming through, like someone who's working with your label, for example, sure. or one of your new artists, how does streaming work for them, and how do you talk to them about what they can do? And I mean, for, for us, we go, after, we go after the money, you know. Um, if, if we're a record label, we've we got to make sure that our guys are getting paid if they have 10 million plays. It's a lot of money for these guys, because they don't make any money, you know. So, it's just about going after it and, and making sure that they do get paid because, you know, every streaming service does pay, mm. you know, with, and, and today it's, it's really transparent. I can, mm. I can go as, I can pin down one person in a country that's listened to my song, mm. you know, with Spotify's new services that they do, I can go in so deep into it that it's, it's the most transparent I've ever had in the record business, not even in the vinyl days, I was sure about the, the plant pushing too many vinyls. I, I had no idea, mm. you know. So um, now it's pretty transparent for me, at least. Yeah. Mm. Look, the, the the streaming thing. What what I really like about it, we are in this sort of era where, at some level, streaming and digital has become more important than radio, which I'm for, me, for, for certainly for me and my artists is is, uh, is really really great. Yeah. Um, and the, the thing about radio was, you know, you take it, you, you, and obviously. We, People st we still take tracks to radio, but it's come and gone very quickly, and it's almost like you move on. Nowadays, you know, if, you get a f if you've got a focus track, you, wanna, you launch it, and radio is one of the things that you want to, but the streaming of that track obviously will carry on forever, so you just want to keep working and keep working and building and adding more music to it and building up something that's, that's interesting. Mm -hmm. So it's not just about this promo, promo, radio slog. I, mean, I was going to talk because you, you have an album coming soon, sure. and you're constantly working on new <coughs> albums. I mean, what is an album launch nowadays in this age of streaming and, and digital stuff compared um, to what it used to be? <laughs> For me, this album was different because it's, I, I put three years into making it, you know, so it wasn't something that I just wanted to throw out there and be, you know, put together for a couple months. So I worked crazy on, on making video content and partnering with interesting companies and um, having cool launches within the album and now I've decided to split my album and, and do chapters where we release, you know, we have a pre-order that releases a couple tracks, then we go into a 
a chapter of the album, which is going to be half the album. Then we present six videos. Then we go into the second half, and then we go with six other videos. So mm. for me, it's, it, it's just interesting to see what's happening, because the kids today are different from what they used to be. You know, mm. We have kids that are spending eight, nine hours a day on their phones on social media. You know, and, and it's, it's like if I would read 30 newspapers a day. You know, the information <laughs> is just flowing really fast. So for me, it, to split it up is going to make it more interesting for me and the fans, because they can be part of it. And if you're trying to tell a story today with an album, you need their, their attention. You know? So um, it's different. But you know, streaming, for me, both downloads and streaming, it's, it's, it's the evolution of, of, of music services. And you know, we just, a, lot of, a lot of people are fighting it. But I think it's the best thing that's ever happened. Because like you said earlier, I don't need radio. And I don't make music necessarily for the radio all the time. Yeah. <clears throat> but I can still make the numbers. So, so for me, it's, it's still a really important yeah, and look as well. The uh, from an artist's business perspective, an album is really is, is important from the perspective of the touring cycle. The the live business is that hasn't changed much in that basis. When you talk to promoters and agents, they'll say to you, "When's your album coming out? Oh, your album's coming out. Then we can start planning True. how you're going to play, where you're going to play." And obviously, a lot of our businesses run off tickets now because that's a, that's a very profitable part of the business. But there's no doubt that the album is 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 a still an event. It's not as massive an event to say it was for us in the 90s and the noughties, but it's, it's, still an, it's still an important event in that business of an, of an artist. I heard it talked about that in the old days, you had to, all the marketing was weighted towards selling copies of the album quite early on, but now it's shifting towards how do you get people to listen six months down the line, a year down the line, it's attention. I suppose. Yeah, I mean, for, for me, I created a lot of content, you know. Yeah. <clears throat> um, my album cycles nine months, and, and I usually, a digital album cycle is two weeks, you know. But for me, it's you know I, I created virtual reality experiences. I've built um, uh, live streaming apps, and I've, I've, we do concert series, and we do a documentary that's split into episodes. And so I've created a lot of these aspects of the of, of the content just to drag out the album because I'm trying to tell a story, you know. So. Yeah. For me, it's, it's, it's different now, but at the same time, I, I, I really miss the old days of marketing where you know, Pink Floyd would release an album and you would just jump right into that world. And, and it was all you talked about for you know, two years. And then I, I miss that because what the digital world is doing is, is you know, people's attention Speed. span is so short. So people just move next thing, next thing all the time. So you just got to drag yeah. them into your world. Yeah, look, and the, the visual content stuff yeah. thing is key, isn't it? Uh, you know, going back to the Nick Cave project, um, one of the things that we did once his, when his album was, came out was we were working on a film project that we knew would come 18 months or two years later. And for everybody in the team, and everybody, that was an important thing because it gave us a lifespan. It wasn't just about a front end and then a rear guard action. It was actually about here's one bookend and here's another bookend. Mm -hmm. And we've got to make up and see what we can do across that period, again, go back to telling that story, really. Okay. I mean, what do you think it means when big artists either opt out of streaming or more likely they window their album and say, I'm not going to release my album on streaming for six months to a year, like Adele or Taylor Swift. Mm. Is that something that's an important stand in a conversation starter, or is it possibly harmful if you want people to pay for these streaming services? How does that kind of weigh into the debate, you think? For me, it's more a publicity thing, you know? Um, People always tend to talk bad about bigger companies when they're about to release an album, mm -hmm. you know, because a lot of people talk about it. And, and, you know, at the same time, yeah, you can stop a couple of stores. I see it as record stores, where, where why would I not allow a couple of stores to release it? There's, there's fans everywhere, and the fans, you know, a 15-year-old might not be able to afford Apple, Spotify, and Tidal, and Google. So if, if you have... 15,000 fans at Spotify, why would you limit those guys to hear your music? Um, you know, we, we make, us bigger touring artists, we make enough money touring, you know? Yeah. We, 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 we should just be happy that people support us and, and, yeah. and, and try to make the best of it. Um, yeah, I think for, for me, for the, the, the big picture of it, it's, it's an irrelevance. Uh, it's, uh, it's a big news item, it's a story, it's an event for, for, for those. And, and it's great if, if that's what artists, some artists want to do and that their principles, True. fine, go for it. 
if it's if they if their event if if their management or the business partners or whatever are, are creating events, that's fine. I don't think it has too much of a uh, an impact on the real big business stuff. Mm. So, I mean, you mentioned free, and I'm quite interested because you've both done stuff around free in the past. So you were involved in In Rainbow's Radiohead's mm. album, where you could get it for free if you wanted, mm. and you could pay. And you, I think you gave away size records, sure. 100 and something tracks with, with Google. Yeah. What did you learn from those experiences of, of, of giving stuff away for free and then seeing how it came back to you? I think it was incredibly important for me because I wanted to talk about the story of, of the record label um, to all these new fans. So, so by doing that initiative with Google, I, I, I had an idea of giving out a whole decade of music for free. Uh, which we did uh, for a limited time. Um, I think we had about 700,000 uh, people log in and download really? content. Uh, we had almost 70 million downloads. Mm -hmm. So wow. that was massive for us. Mm. That's scale. And then you, I mean, in Rainbows, it's kind of, it's almost history in a weird way now. It's it is. But what did you learn about the idea of if you let people have something for free, they will still pay? Or the, they will? the big thing for, all, for us that were involved in that project and the, and doing different business things going forward is it's it's all about trying to find things that are exciting and inspiring. Mm -hmm. You know, it wasn't a, it was never designed to be a business model for the future. I think it was what was the right thing at that right time and got everybody excited. Mm -hmm. uh, and and we try and push that not, whether not just in terms of the crea you know the artists and the creativity that they will have with making their records or making their visual content, but how can the business thing be exciting as well? And if you can keep all that exciting, then it's kind of a one feeds the other, mm -hmm. uh, and uh, we seem to we find that time again. So the, my, the big thing I got out of that was was just to keep pushing the boundaries, keep cutting edge, keep driving exciting, inspiring things. And uh, you know, for me, one of the interesting parts about where we're at in the world is, is that as this sort of artist fan relationship business becomes more and more the norm, rather than this you know funnel of supply down a you know a very structured supply chain. With, with, with that artist fan thing going on, there's so much more tech and so many more different ideas coming into it. At some level, it's quite difficult to keep up with everything that's going on. Mm -hmm. But at least you have those opportunities to pick and choose interesting, exciting things to do, which I think all augments what you're trying to do as creators. Mm, okay. Well, I mean, we're almost off, but the last question I was going to ask about partnerships with the technology industry, because you were talking about doing things with virtual reality and partnerships with Google and talking sure. to Daniel Ek. And I think you, I mean, what is the scope for music tech companies to come and work with artists versus the past where it might have been just we need to get a license from labels? Is there lots of opportunity there? Yeah, I mean, I, I work with people all the time, you know, and I, I, I think those are the most fun collaborations because when it becomes too big, when, when a tech company goes to a record label or a publisher, it becomes too complicated and it becomes really stiff and strict. Um, and, and for me, I've always worked, want to work with creatives straight, up, straight instead of you know, we can get in a room and we can get ideas together and we can execute uh, on, on the day if we want to. So, you know, I, I think it's, it, it's a good, it's a really good thing to do. Okay. I guess lastly, Bradley, are you seeing companies coming to you and saying, how can we work with your artists? Oh, yeah. Look, it's a, it's a melting pot. There's lots of people, lot, particularly young startup businesses that are trying to push their business forward. So that tie in with young creators or any creators is great. Uh, you know, look, historically, technology and uh, the major rights corporations have had a difficult time, whether that's like a Google and a Universal or a Sony and a Spotify, etc. But I think at that human being level, yeah. creators and tech create, you know, music creators and tech creators, it's a real hotbed. Mm. Good. Well, uh, thank you. I mean, we've, this is our discussion. You're both speaking again tomorrow, I believe, so there's a chance to see you talk about other issues. But um, otherwise, thank you very much, and thank you for coming to watch. Thank you. Everyone. Thank you.